What real magic is about is saying that there's legends as long as humans have been around, that there are certain practices that you can do which allow you to manipulate the world in various ways, to perceive through space and time, to change the way that the world works. That's, that's magic. Hello, passionate listeners and watchers. Welcome to Passion Harvest. Thank you so much for joining me wherever you are in the world right now. I am Louisa, your host, and I'm so excited about our guest today, Dr. Dean Radden. What is real magic? For over three decades, Dr. Dean Radden has been engaged in the research on the frontiers of consciousness. Dr. Radden is Chief Scientist at the Institute of Noetic Science and Associated Distinguished Professor of Integral and Transpersonal Psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He's also co-founder and chairman of the Board of Co-Genetics. Dr. Radden is an author or co-author of hundreds of scientific, technical and popular articles and he has four best-selling books, The Conscious Universe, Entangled Minds, Supernormal, and Real Magic. In 2017, he was named one of the 100 most inspiring people in the world. This is his story, and this is his passion, Dr. Dean Radden. I'm so excited to have you on Passion Harvest today. Welcome to the show. Thank you for asking me. How powerful is faith in our consciousness, in our intentions, in our desires? Well, expectation and belief are other words for faith, mm. right? Mm. It's what what you expect or what you want to happen and what, what will you allow to happen. So when you go to a movie, you, dis, you suspend your disbelief, right? Because otherwise it's no fun to watch a movie. You have to be suspending. Well... In, in doing a, uh, an experiment involving affirmations, you kind of want to suspend your disbelief because you don't, you don't want to push it. You don't want your belief to push it too much, but at least you have to be open to it. So you can think of faith in another way here. They simply have faith that whatever's going to happen is going to happen and you're not going to block it. That is kind of an open-minded belief or open-minded way of being in considering these kinds of things. As I said, our experiments show that belief does help. But you have to be careful because if you believe too much, you're going to see things that actually didn't happen. I mean, you can override your senses even and your memory with very strong belief. This is a problem that is faced all the time in, in court cases where you have an eyewitness to something who believed something strongly and will report it as such, but it actually is not true. So there's a balance that you need. That's why I was saying the uh, open-minded, allowing something to happen, believing it and, and accepting that it's possible, but not so strongly that you're going to become delusional about it. So that's it, it is a little like a seesaw. It is a bit. And and what why often, I mean, the gosh, this 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 could be hours of a interview, but why often many of us, me included, at some point in time, we have a tendency to think of the worst case scenario, the worst thing that could happen. Everything's going wrong. Why do we do this? Because some parts of us uh, don't believe. It's it's easy. I mean, all of us are built-in skeptics on one thing or another. And when it comes to these kinds of methods, which are traditionally magical methods, we'd like to think that it was a little like Harry Potter. You know, you wave the magic wand and then huge things happen. And that's not the way that this works. These effects are subtle. And so it's very easy to wish really, really hard for something and it's not showing up. And immediately our skeptical mind will jump in the way and say, well, this is nonsense. It, this isn't working. Well, sometimes it's not going to work because it depends a lot on what it is that the affirmation is about. So for an example, if you look at a, a traditional book of magical spells, a grimoire, they, the, the, most of them are about control. Most of the magical spells, it's about getting money, getting power, getting sex, getting something if that requires, if the 
affirmation requires that somebody else behave differently or that something magically appears that would be quite unusual to appear, it might happen. And in fact, the affirmation increases the likelihood that it'll happen. But imagine then that one likelihood is you flip a coin, you want it to land a certain way. So the odds are 50-50. The other one is that you, for no apparent reason, a, you will be given a gold-plated Mercedes and it will show up in your driveway and there it is, free and clear. So in one case, you have 50-50 odds. In the other case, you have a bazillion odds to one that that's going to happen. So it could happen. And thinking about it a lot will improve the odds from a gazillion to one against chance to maybe 10 million, which is a huge change. But it's still 10 million to one. It's it's not likely to happen anytime soon. The other thing about affirmations is that uh, we want it to happen now. Like, like you know, yeah. now I want it <laughs> right here. And sometimes that will happen, but usually not. So sometimes it'll happen when you kind of completely forget about it and it'll happen weeks or months later. So that's, it still happened. But, you know, you think about you're adjusting the way that the universe works to give you the thing that you wanted. And depending on how many other people inv are involved and what else is involved in making it happen, it could take a long time. So it's a, part of the idea of doing an affirmation is not to give up too soon. I'm looking for a little example of that. Okay. So I mentioned gold-plated Mercedes. So I once used that example in an interview and one of the people watching was an uh, uh, acquaintance of mine who happens to be a practicing witch. And so she said, uh, well, uh, pretty much what I just said now, that you, you need to carry this strong intention and focus for quite a long time, simultaneously putting everything you have into that intention, but not caring about it also. Right. That's a paradox. It's the, This is the so-called effortless striving. And not going to that fear or that doubt. Yeah, well, you can have it, but by doing lots of repetition and recognizing that, you know, you don't need it instantly, it it allows it to unfold. And there are magical methods that people use to help your intention. So I used the example of a gold-plated Mercedes, and uh, I said, you know, this, it could happen, but uh, you also have to be extremely clear about exactly what it is that you want. So... One day in the mail, I get this. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> so this is a Mercedes. It's gold-plated. And, and there, now I have it. Well, it was my friend, the practicing witch, who sent it to me as a way of reminding me that I didn't say that I wanted one I can get into and actually drive right. around. So I did get a gold-plated Mercedes. And totally unknown to me that she even had this in mind. But it's a good reminder that part of the notion of doing an affirmation that is effective is to be absolutely crystal clear on exactly what it is that you want. And that makes the probability higher. It is not easy to push the universe around. We, we can push small, smaller things around. We have, in a sense, micro free will to do what we wish. Uh, it's unlikely that I could use affirmation all day long for my entire life and probably not change the orbit of Pluto Mm -hmm. at least to a way that we can measure it because it's too big. We, we, even Harry Potter may not be able to do that. I mean, and that's fictional magic. Uh, but for smaller things that, especially that don't impinge on others, on other people too much uh, or at all, those are, I would say, easier or more, more likely to actually happen. Well, I have to talk, I'm looking at your book, Real Magic, behind you. I have to talk about that for those that haven't read it and should read it. What's it about, please? And what what are your tips to embody this magic within our lives? Real Magic is, in a sense, a book about uh, philosophical ways of looking at what reality is. And I didn't want to put the word philosophy in the book or on the title because nobody would ever look at it. <laughs> but it's important because 
there are people who go in, into the academic world and become philosophers. Most scientists are either never encounter or never take a course in philosophy, which is a pity because everything that everybody does is always based on a set of assumptions, whether they know it or not. Science has all kinds of assumptions underneath it. The underlying philosophy in science is materialism. Everything is made out of matter and energy, including everything that you call me. So your entire subjective sense of reality and your experiences from a scientific perspective today is considered to arise out of the operation of your brain. So the neurosciences study brain activity and somehow a world is constructed out of three pounds of neural tissue inside your head. That's, that's like our, our sense of the external world. But we also have an internal world. It's our internal sense of what things feel like. Like the, you taste an onion, it has a certain kind of spiky flavor that you could not actually see from the outside. If you would measure everything about the brain, you knew everything about all the neurons, you still wouldn't know what it feels like from the inside. Mm. So this suggests a, a kind of a split between our sense of reality. We have apparently a physical world out there that has certain regularities to it. Science has been very good at understanding those. Science knows very, very little about the inside sense of reality. So we know that when, when we're looking out at things, it's we're, we're constructing that. The brain actually is kind of a very fancy computer and it is constructing the colors, the feelings, the sounds, all of that, all of the everyday world is a construction. But what's doing the constructing? It is this internal sense of consciousness seems to be involved in some very important way in the way that we perceive the world, the way we experience it and everything else. So this is where philosophy is important because philosophy says that there's we can think of the world as, comp as composed of two parts. There does appear to be a real physical world out there and it has certain, certain properties to it, but we can't deny the inside either. And so we can't have a complete scientific way of understanding reality until we understand both sides to to much greater degree than we do. Well, an idealistic philosophy says that the only thing you will ever know is your own internal subjective experience. And everything else, including everything about all of our science, about other people, about everything, is an emergent property of your own consciousness. The only thing you can know is what's happening on the inside. We can't know directly what's happening on the outside. So the esoteric traditions are all based on that idea that maybe the external world is actually emerging, like the, all of its properties are emerging out of consciousness, which is not just inside you, it's everywhere. So the physical body, your brain, all of that <clears throat> are precisely and idiosyncratically attuned in some way to experience this consciousness. So it's like you're a piece of consciousness walking around in a physical form and it, having experiences as a result. From that perspective, the physical world emerges out of awareness. And so if I apply my awareness, I can literally create the world. I'm creating the physical world that, that we, we co-experience. Mm -hmm. But it's not just me. It's, it's like the collection of consciousness is in humans and all other sentient creatures and probably in many other ways that we don't even know about yet that we don't have names for so that's a, like permeating consciousness everywhere okay so that that's a philosophy under where where we start what real magic is about is saying that there's legends as long as humans have been around that there are certain practices that you can do which allow you to manipulate the world in various ways to perceive through space and time, to change the way that the world works. That's that's magic, traditional magic. Science has been looking at these practices for a long time. Uh, anthropologists have been looking at so-called indigenous practices for even longer. And it, what it boils down to is that the, the practices that people have done 
all the way back to shamanism, probably 50,000 years or more, come down to three categories. There's divination, which means seeing through space and time or perceiving through space and time. There's force of will, which is affirmations, changing the world. And then there's theurgy, which is the notion that there are other forms of usually non-physical intelligence, spirits, that we can communicate with and ask them to do things on our behalf. Those are the three categories. Science has looked at all three of those categories and we have very strong evidence that divination is real. We have pretty good evidence that force of will is real. And we have sort of moderate evidence that theurgy or the theurgic events are real. By being real, it means many, many repeatable experiments by independent people getting roughly the same results. That's like, that's the currency of truth in science. Well, we have that. We, we know that that's true. So it, it took a, a small book to explain from beginning to end why we have that confidence. And then I gave a bunch of examples of the kinds of experiments that are done to show how we would go about testing if these kinds of concepts are actually real or not. So that's what the book is about. In, in in your belief, is magic possible? Is it real? I mean, what is real? We've just spoken what is real. It's based on our consciousness. Is it is magic real? Well, I would not, in my own case, I would say yes, but I need to put in a caveat that it's not based on belief without evidence, right? Science is based on belief with evidence. So the reason why I believe that, yeah, there's, there is some truth to the notion of traditional magical concepts is because of a wealth of controlled scientific evidence that supports that idea. So I didn't come at the belief first, I came at it after, after looking at it, and not only looking at, but actually conducting quite a few experiments myself. Um, thank you for answering that. I know you've spoken also about before about expanding your consciousness or raising your conscious awareness. Um, how would we do this to connect with all those three elements that you looked at in uh, magic? Traditionally, it's meditation. Meditation is a way of both training the mind to focus, which is especially part of affirmations, but it also is important in the other elements of magic. So meditation, uh, some types of psychedelic drugs will, will push you. Uh, some people, that's fine. Other people should not do that. In fact, some people shouldn't even meditate. Small percentage of people who start to meditate will become psychotic. Not many, like 2%. Right. Some people who take psychedelics can't handle that either, and they shouldn't do it. Uh, and then uh, these are all the traditional methods, meditation, psychedelics. And the third one, unfortunately, is talent. It's it's yeah. you, you have it or you don't. So this comes from uh, the yogic traditions, the, the yoga sutras, where in the, the book of the Yoga Sutras, one, one part of the, the whole series is all about these special powers that arise as a result of meditative practice. And in that book, it actually says that the ways that you would gain these powers, and the same is true for magical methods, meditation is the, the time-honored, probably safest way to do it. Certain drugs will do it too. It'll kind of launch you into that direction. And talent. So this has been known for thousands of years. You spoke about time and space before. This is a, another massive topic that we're condensing. Thank you so much. Is, is past, present, and future occurring now? Well, that is actually the first city in, in the yoga tradition. City meaning is the same Sanskrit word meaning power or attainment. So, and the, According to the Yoga Sutras and according to surveys we've run, uh, for people who either have started to, to do meditation practice or have been doing it for a long time, the first thing that they usually say that they notice of an unusual character is that they start noticing synchronicities more, that, that meaningful coincidences just seem to start happening. Uh, the, 
That is closely related to the notion of perceiving past, present, and future at the same time. It's like an, an expansion of awareness. That's pretty common. And so uh, we actually did an experiment on this some years ago where we, uh, we recruited eight people who had done daily meditative practice for at least 20 years, 20 years or more. Wow. Okay. And then we found eight controls who had never meditated. So we, we did this uh, up at our laboratory, which is in Northern California. And the, the joke uh, here is that it was pretty easy to find people who have been very long meditators. It was really hard to find people who had never meditated at all. That's maybe something to do with the culture from where we are. The location, yes. <laughs> so the experiment was very simple. We would have people wear glasses that had little LEDs right in front of your eyes and we could cause them to flash. It was a very, very low level of illumination, but with your eyes closed, you can suddenly see a flash. We also had them wear earbuds so they could hear a tone. So they'd say, okay, go into your meditative state. And sometimes we're gonna flash a light and sometimes we're gonna play a tone. And meanwhile, we have, a, I forget if we had 32 or 64 channel EEG, we're looking at the brain activity. So they just did that for 20 minutes, occasionally to get a light flash, occasionally get an audio tone measuring their EEG. And the hypothesis was that for the long-term meditators, they had reported that they would occasionally get into a state that they would call timelessness, as though their sense of the present kept expanding into the past and into the future. Well, expanding into the past, we can call memory. So that's not mm -hmm. too surprising. But expanding into the future is not supposed to happen, according to thermodynamics. But nevertheless, uh, we wanted to see whether this internal sense of an expansion of the present moment was only subjective or whether it was ontologically true. And the way you would see that is, would their brain respond in a way that we can measure before the light flash or before the audio tone. Right. So we so that was that was a hypothesis, and that is exactly what we saw. So uh, about one and a half seconds before a light flash or an audio tone, we would see that portion of the brain respond appropriately. It's not responding to something because it actually hasn't happened yet. It was reacting to something that would happen one and a half seconds in the future. So that's consistent with the idea that internally, subjectively, their sense of now began to expand and the brain responded appropriately. This did not happen in the controls who had not meditated. It's so interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's just such a fascinating subject. You also spoke about synchronicities and higher power, other energies. Many people say synchronicities are signs from the universe or symbols or signs showing up to show us we're on the right path or some sort of coincidence. What, what's your thoughts on that? Well, it might be a sign. It, it might be coincidence in some cases. It's We don't know. Anything that happens uh, of, of this nature in spontaneous everyday life very difficult to know what's going on. But the reason why we do experiments in the laboratory is because we are, in a sense, creating a meaningful coincidence in time. Mm -hmm. That's that's what all of these experiments are about. We want to, somebody describes a precognition or a telepathic experience or something like that in an uncontrolled environment like the real world, you don't know what's going on. But when we go into the laboratory, we do know what's going on. By definition, we've created a context which is somewhat artificial. It's not spontaneous, and it can't be like every the everyday world. But we have very high control of it, so we know what is chance. We know what's not chance. We know it's not caused by accidentally hearing something or peripheral vision and all of those kinds of things. And so what we can say then is that we know in principle that if somebody has a meaningful coincidence, synchronicity, that that might be related to precognition. It might be related to perception through space and time. It could be related to all kinds of things that we know can happen, but in that particular case, very difficult to be able to say exactly why it happened. Thank you. Um, in your opinion, 
maybe you get this question or why why are we here what is our purpose yeah that's a tough one i know <laughs> yeah um i i don't know the, the a related question is why is there anything at all right so we we tell ourselves stories it might be true you know mm -hmm. we're spiritual beings gaining experience in a physical form that's kind of comforting it kind of gives an explanation and as humans we we strongly desire logical meaningful rational explanations for everything we we seem to we 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 need to land on something because otherwise it's uncomfortable living in all this ambiguity well uh, dr radden i have to congratulate you on being such a you know, a thought leader in this field and, and and all your incredible research that you've done. Um, I'd like to ask you, based on all your work after many, many, many years, how do we how, how does one live a joyful life or their best life or most aligned life? There's so many ways to put it. What what's your advice? Follow your bliss. All right, Joseph Campbell. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, he said, I mean, how, how you can't make it more pithy than that. You find out what you're passionate about and you figure out a way of uh, making your work and play to follow that passion if you can in a responsible way. So it really is follow your bliss and then a whole bunch of caveats afterwards and make sure you're not harming anybody else, you're not harming yourself and so on. But if you find something that you're passionate about, which could be almost literally anything, again, provided it's not hurting anybody, uh, doing that is what makes life worthwhile. So for me, I've always been driven by curiosity, curiosity about everything. So of the, the many different things that I, I've studied and had jobs for and all the rest, the thing that I continually find the most curious is, in, in a nutshell, the, the abilities or powers of the mind. Because I, first of all, I, I don't understand it well enough to to know, like, do I do I really understand something or I don't, I, I don't know. So it, it continually pushes curiosity to figure out more. And as I said before, the more you go into it, the more you realize that we were just barely scratching the surface of, of what's possible at this point. And so for me, that's exciting. Yeah. Right. I mean, we're trying to understand ourselves and our role in the universe and our relationship to the physical world. And all of it is really important in some way, having to do with with properties like attention and intention, those kinds of things. And then what from that perspective, you look back at magical practices and you look at how science have, have studied them. It, you could almost get a sense I'm not saying that I understand it completely yet, but you kind of get a sense that after a while, the, the shamans who were doing this 20,000 years ago, they, they weren't stupid. They were they had figured out ways to make things happen. For, in most cases, in their, in their sense, it was for survival reasons. They had to find the food tomorrow, and they had to find a way of protecting the tribe and all of that. It was really pragmatic. Today, we don't have usually the same kind of pressures for most people. Uh, but the same underlying sense of wanting control is there. Uh, or even if it's not about control, it's just simply a matter of curiosity. That impulse is still there as well. And so for me, that's my passion. And somehow I get paid for doing this. So Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, Dr. Radden, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience that I haven't asked you? about i don't think so i mean the the in my book i go in not enormous detail the the publisher said uh you have 200 pages well, i thought well how can i write anything in 200 pages <laughs> uh, but i managed to squeeze it in there the the essence of it and so now i'm thinking maybe it should have a follow-up book on practical magic because some people don't really care about the the underlying science or the philosophy or the history of it, even though it's all important. They just want to know, what do I do? Like, yes. well, how, how can I do this? So what, in one chapter in the book, I give some methods, but there's, there's of course, a, a million different ways that people can approach this. 
The part that people don't want to hear is that it's talent also plays a role. And sorry, if you're born in the wrong place or by the wrong parents or something, then you may not have that. This doesn't mean that if somebody wanted to play tennis, almost anybody can learn the rules and almost everybody can play it to one degree or another. Not many will become champions, but that doesn't mean that you can't do it. So I think that every sentient creature to some extent, and humans, including, not all humans are sentient, I think, but of those who are, uh, can you can you manipulate the world using magical methods? The answer is yes. The degree to which you can do that is going to be different from one person to the other. And also whether you meditate or if you take the right kind of psychedelics or whatever. So they, the, the potential is there for, for anybody who can, who can do anything. Well, that offers a lot of faith and hope for all of us. I just have to ask you one more question. And you did talk about this during our interview, but what, what are some of the tips in simple terms for creating magic, for real magic? Well, one of the methods, a uh, time-honored method, is called writing magic. So a lot of people will write in a diary or a journal about what happened during the day, or maybe their thoughts and wishes and so on. Writing magic is not that different from that, that you you write down what you want. Presuming in most cases, you you want something to happen. It's you're wishing for health for you or for somebody else, or you want money or whatever it happens to be. You write that down and then you, you make sure that it's clear. Like the thing that you're asking for is very, very clear, very precisely what you want. And you keep refining it down until it's it's a like one sentence, extremely clear thing that you want. And then you may write it down a few hundred times just to kind of cement it, you know, to kind of get it in your head. And then you set that aside because you don't want to dwell on it too much. It sort of needs to sink into your unconscious. And then maybe once a week, you go back and look at that and you do it again. Write it down again a hundred times and set it aside. And keep doing that until something is beginning to show that that worked, whatever it happens to be. So the simpler it is, the more likely it's going to happen. And also the more likely it'll happen sooner rather than later. There's no guarantee in any of it. Because uh, as I said, uh, with the example of my gold-plated Mercedes, this one does not change the world very much. Because there's lots of these out there and you know you, yeah. you can buy it. To have an actual gold plate of Mercedes, of which are probably very few in the world, show up in that is now mine means all kinds of things had to happen out there in the world for them to make that happen. It's not going to go poof. It things need to happen in order for that to show up. So simple, clear affirmations are much more likely to happen sooner rather than later. But that doesn't mean you could write something which is very complex or something that is a priori unlikely because those will those could happen too. So most of them of the traditional magicians that I know, not stage magicians, but real ones, they they practice a lot. They do these kinds of practices a lot and they keep track of what worked because it'll be slightly different for everybody. So keeping a journal where you write the affirmations and then putting notes in there saying, oh, this happened and then this happened. And if it, if the thing, if the crystal clear affirmation that you put down turns out to be so, celebrate it and then go on to the next one. Wonderful, wonderful tip. Thank you. Thank you so much, <laughs> Dr. Dean Radden. It really has been such an honour to have you on Passion Harvest and um, congratulations on Real Magic and all your other books that I spoke about in your introduction. And um, it's been such a so insightful and delightful to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Thanks. It's been my pleasure. A pleasure. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. If you liked this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interviews.